Okay, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Blown Speakers, episode 13. Okay, and today we have two very special guests uh, coming in from uh, Chicago and Kentucky. And um, okay, so first, uh, all right, first let's welcome from Chicago, we have G. Ron Meyer. Thank you for hello, joining us, G. Ron. Thank you for having me. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs> and uh, coming in from Kentucky, we have Berea, Kentucky. Is that right? That's right. Uh, we have Walnut Johnson. <laughs> Hello. Thank How's you everybody guys. doing? Thank you for Very joining good. us. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for see. having me. And, and of course, we have Greg from Buffalo, right? Good to see you, Greg. Yeah. <laughs> good to be seen. <laughs> Hi, Greg. Hey. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I'm your host, uh, Dave, coming in from Yokohama, Japan. And uh, yeah, it's our first time to do it with four talking wow. heads. So let's... Oh, is this the first time for four, really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. But um, okay. Um, and let's see, you guys, uh, Greg, as you said, it's very uh, snowy in Buffalo now. Is that right? Yeah, a fair bit of snow, and uh, it's snowing a bit now and cold, but um, I like um, I like when we have snowstorms. Vested interest as a uh, as a teacher, I think, probably <laughs> for snow days more. <laughs> but it, I, it, and it kind of, for me, it kind of, it, it's not, you know, grounded in science, but it kind of calms my anxiety about climate change when we still have snow or you know like okay things but that that doesn't make sense because you know it's going to increase but it kind of at least like okay we're still getting snow things aren't that bad because it should be cold and snowy in buffalo in the winter so um it could be a drag towards the end but i like it so hmm. but G, G ron you said it was snowy up in chicago this weekend huh? or yes 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 or it is it's been uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's probably a lot like Buffalo. It's very cold, and uh, it's been very snowy over the last week. So, yeah, we're sitting under, I don't know, a good foot of snow, if not more, and, and single-digit weather. So it's – I'm okay with the snow. Um, what, once temperatures get into the teens, I, I'm out. So I'm, I'm not enjoying it maybe as much as Greg is, but, uh, but I'm hoping it turns around. Yeah. So, uh, Wal Walnut, how, how is it down in Berea, Kentucky? A lot of snow or what? Um, actually, tropical conditions, um, <laughs> you know, about, 90, about 90, 90 degrees, I guess. Um, I sat out under some palm trees uh, this afternoon and read and, uh, you know, sunned myself a little bit. No, I'm totally lying. Um, obviously, it's, um, you know, not bad. It's actually icy. We had an ice storm. Yeah. Um, and it was mild. It wasn't as bad as everybody said it was going to be, but we did have ice all, and the trees and everything is covered in ice. It's actually beautiful. Hmm. Yeah. But it's about, you know, in the 30s, you know, it's not extremely cold, but it's cold. So that's a, yeah. happening in Berea. I have a brother who lives in Austin, Texas, and he sent me pictures uh, Thursday night. They had an ice storm in Austin, too. Yeah. Which is a, a ways oh, from yeah. Kentucky, but yeah, yeah, they must have. Maybe it was the same front, possibly. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the it was beautiful with the ice. He sent a picture of a tree, looked like a spider web, like yeah. glistening. Yeah, on the branches. Yeah, it's still like that actually right now. Um, it's it's really pretty when the sun hits everything too. So yeah, but yeah, it's it's actually not bad. You know, typical winter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> all right, the reason we've come together today is to discuss uh, this band, just a moment, Do -do. this album, I should say, boom, okay, yeah. <sighs> Episode 13, we are discussing Fugazi's 1990 album, Repeater, right? Um, and this was the choice of uh, G. Ron Meyer, and he recruited uh, Walnut Johnson. Okay, so we're going to yeah. hear some of your exactly. stories about Fugazi. But um, for the uninitiated, uh, <laughs> let me quickly introduce this band. 
Okay. Um, let's see. The guy in the front here, this is Joe Lally, right? He's the bass player, the bassist. Mm -hmm. uh, on the left here, this is Guy Pachudo, right? And he's the vocalist, uh, vocalist and guitarist, right? And Ian Mackay is also vocalist and guitarist. And let's see, his name is Brandon Canty. Brent. Yeah. Brandon. Brandon, Brandon Canty. Brandon yeah. Canty is the drummer. Okay. So, um, looking a bit like Morrissey there. That's an interesting. <laughs> <thing. laughs> they all look uh, stupidly young in that picture. Yeah. Like, I don't know. That must be yeah. from when they first got together. That's, that's yeah. crazy to see. <laughs> um, so, Ian Mackay was in Minor Threat, right? From 19. So, he was 18 when he was in Mi Minor Threat from. Uh, 1980 to 1983, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. tell me, right. <clears throat> Minor Threat. <clears throat> Minor Threat was a hardcore hardcore band. Okay, they're they're credited with starting the the Straight Edge movement, right? Because mm -hmm. they, had, they had a song called Straight Edge, and the Straight Edge movement uh, emphasized a lifestyle without alcohol or other drugs, or promiscuous sex. Okay, so it was kind of going against the grain of the kind of punk rock ideology of excess and um, self-abuse, <laughs> right? I think um, like rock and roll, I'll, sorry to jump, just down you know, that rock and roll, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, you know, throughout, especially the late 60s and 70s, you know? Hmm. Yeah, I suppose that's true. They're, they're making some kind of a statement, right? Which I think yeah. that exact statement didn't follow into Fugazi, but they, they were still making some sort of a anti-big yeah. capitalistic rock and roll type statement as they, as they moved on to Fugazi. So. Well, they still fell into some of that with Fugazi because of the, the whole thing with merchandise, you know, not really, you know, selling yeah, yeah. merchandise with anything, T-shirts or stickers or anything like that. Um, you know, being against that. And, um, and a friend of mine who um, was kind of friends with him um, named Mark, um, he, he told me that they, you know, like in their van, they didn't watch TV or anything. They, they read books. They had like piles of books everywhere. Hmm. So, you know, they were just sort of anti, I don't know, media, I guess, as well. Hmm. As Interesting. All right. So, yeah. Taking taking the road less traveled. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. was, when I was in high school, there was a, a, a guidance counselor. He was a, a Jesuit. Well, they were all, you know, I went to a Jesuit high school. But this, this guy, Father Carr, was a counselor. So he used to read who, um, the poem, T Taking the Road Less Traveled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Robert who, Frost. Um, <laughs> Frost, yeah. Robert yeah. Frost. <clears throat> so, you know, and... He would say, don't take the road of good times and, you know, telling us don't do stupid things and party and, you know. But really, I mean, it, they're really Fugazi and, and Minor Threat and, well, Ian Mackay, they're really idealists and really were yeah. taking the road less traveled, mm. you know. For sure. Oh, yeah. 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 They, they decided to, to do the whole rock and roll thing their, their own way, for better or for right, worse, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Um. And so, yeah, so Ian was from Minor Threat. Uh, yeah. He, Guy, and Brandon. Brandon. I don't want to say it wrong again. It's yeah. Brandon. <laughs> Brandon. Brandon. Uh, Brandon, sorry. Guy and, Guy and Brandon <laughs> were from Rites of Spring, right? Right, right. Yes. So they were in a band together. What I, I think is really interesting is when they started, it was just the, the three of them, right? Guy wasn't in it, right? And right. Uh, they're originally just a trio. So Walnut, you know all this story. Do you want to go ahead with that? Uh, a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I just know that that Guy came later. Um, I mean, they started like you said. They started as a three piece, and then when Guy came in, he was originally I thought just um, he didn't play guitar. He was just in the middle um, singing, mm. and he didn't actually play guitar. He was almost like the lead guy. Um, really. Okay. Yeah, and then and then eventually he started to play guitar, and um, and then you know he and Ian both shared vocals, you know, at the same time or separately. But um, yeah, so 
you got it. I mean, that's pretty much the history. <laughs> that's what I know as well. So one, yeah. Um, yeah, one version I heard is that, um, yeah, so there are the three piece, but like Guy was just totally drawn to them, right? <laughs> but he, but right. he felt he didn't have a place in the band, right? Because he's a, he's a vocalist guitarist, right? And they already have Ian. So it was like, what, what's yeah. he going to do? But he just hmm. kind of organically just kept, you know, was hanging out with them, would even show up at practices, you know, started singing backup vocals. He's helping them set up and stuff. And eventually, you huh. know, okay. Ian just invited him to join him. And they just, oh wow, yeah, just kind of um, decided well, to essentially go with two two front men and two lead guitarists. Yeah, cool. I, well, didn't I know don't that. know how much guitar experience Guy had, but I mean, he became amazing. Mm. You know, yeah. <laughs> maybe he was just, uh, you know, and you know, maybe he was a, a beginner. I don't know, but uh, if he was, he was an amazing beginner. <laughs> so he he really added a lot to the to the whole mix. Well, he he did, and no, no, he had to have been a guitar player because I've I've got uh, my old Rites of Spring also cassette. You, I, oh my I, gosh, all I have is cassettes of these, well, and he is yeah. he is labeled as being guitar and vocals with Rites of Spring. So, okay. so no, he, he okay. came with some guitar knowledge. Yeah, and, yeah, well, good. And, yeah, uh, well, they were on Discord too, weren't yeah. they? They were. Yep, and this is uh, eighty six, eighty seven is what it says. Hmm. Uh, produced by Ian, I think, right? I think it was, yeah. So, um, yeah, so Ian um, started Discord Records with uh, Jeff Nelson from from Minor Threat, right, in 1980, right? So even though he was a young, he was 18, right? He okay. was already, like, yeah, yeah. in his second band, starting his own yeah. label. So always, like, just <laughs> from the beginning, he really had an idea that he wanted to do things his oh, own yeah. way, right? Right. Um, and they still, there's, um, Dave, I think I mentioned to you, I don't know if um, G. Ron and uh, Walnut are a fan of Nardwar, the uh, the uh, kind of wacky Canadian um, uh, interviewer. Um, oh, I don't, I don't know that, yeah. no. Yeah, he's, I don't either. He's hilarious. He's been interviewing, you know, uh, musicians for I don't know, over 30 years, I think. Um, but anyway, he's he's inter interviewed Ian Mackay a bunch of times, at least three times. But he just did an interview with him from this spring, and Ian Mackay was from the disc. He was in the Discord house. Um, I don't think he he doesn't live there anymore. But that's still like the base of operations for okay. Discord Records. So that's wow. pretty impressive. It's yeah, he's still got it going after yeah. this long. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, oh, that's it's a great, great interview. Great. I would recommend that to to our panel here and uh, everybody viewing uh, the Nardwar interview with Ian Mackay from I think it's March uh, 2020. Um, really? He talks, okay. He's got an incredible, you know, clear uh, recollection of events from you know Minor Threat and Fugazi and just incredible amount of historical knowledge about like the punk scene and yeah you know um and places they toured and and like being yeah it's really interesting so. that, i mean that, he's, that, he's that, like his own incredible. institution <laughs> yeah <laughs> really yeah <laughs> go ahead g-ron <laughs> well, i was just gonna say that's pretty incredible because for as much as they toured i mean it's, it's like he was always on tour and for for years and years if not you know a decade or more so that's that's pretty amazing that he would still have that that clear of a memory of specific places and specific years that they yeah. were played that's i i, I <laughs> uh, and they I, have i, I, um, I struggled to, to know what happened to me a year ago uh if, you know if that explains a lot <laughs> and he collected a lot of stuff like and nardwar is he's like a savant he's if you ever you watch his interviews, he he really researches and he pulls huh. out all this minutia about the the person, and he gives them gifts of like records or, or souvenirs <laughs> he he knows they'd like. But Ian Mackay will pull he pulled out notes and like receipts from when they traveled because Nardwar is from Vancouver from when they traveled to Net Vancouver and did like you know punk yeah. shows back in the eighties. Wow, um, wow, <laughs> it's, it's it's interesting. That's cool. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, 
I mean, just to uh, to give people an idea, um, this is um, so. Today we're talking about Repeater. It came out in 1990. Uh, <clears throat> yep. It's their first like proper album, but um, they had EPs before that. And in 1989, mm -hmm. they put two of the EPs together that they called 13 songs, right? Which is essentially an album, right? But, yeah, right. But Repeater is considered their first um, official album, right? From their yeah. own labor, from their own label, Discord Records. Um, yeah, you'll see they put out 10, I'm going to say six, six full length um, <laughs> <laughs> albums <laughs> over 11 years. Um and I think the consensus among most Fugazi fans is all the material is pretty solid, right? I mean, like... Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think so. I mean, for me, Repeater's obviously a great one. I, I think second for me is actually in on the Kill Taker. I, I would just always... I don't know. Something about that one has always uh, just kind of struck, struck me well. I know less, honestly, after Red Medicine. So I, I remember that one a little bit. I don't know that end hits from 98. I don't I don't know that one at all. And I remember the argument having some pretty good songs. But for me, yeah. the, those first three, Repeater and, and Steady Diet of Nothing and, and Kill Taker, are the ones that really, I think, stick with me the, the most. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for me, I, I would, like I said before, Steady Diet of Nothing is, I listen to that over and over again. I think I know that one the best. Um, and and part of the, part of that is because of you know some of the tunes that I remember them playing at that electrician's show, uh, and like electrician's hall show, yeah, uh, that really stuck in my mind. And then I heard them on the recording, and then I was hooked to the recording. So um, and then repeater after that, you know, for sure. Um, and then the other ones, yeah, I don't know as well, but I know that there was you know a lot of good material on the rest of them. The argument um, was really good as well. So, yeah, I agree with that. And, and Dave, do you want me to, to mention why we're, we're, we're kind of talking about this album now? Is that a good time to do that? Sure, sure, yeah. You asked me to go over um, Fugazi, or, you know, it seemed like a good topic to, to go over. And I was kind of thinking about that, <laughs> you know, which album would, would make sense to go over. And um, it really immediately it occurred to me to, to get a hold of, uh, my, my old friend Walnut Johnson um, and invite him to be along here uh, for this to kind of discuss this um, just because we had such a a strong shared memory of the first time I think either one of us saw them I don't remember ever seeing them before um, you know the show we'll talk about I had never seen uh, Minor Threat play or um, you know I had never really been into them but, but at the time I knew the name Fugazi I think just from some of the music scene that we were kind of involved in. So I, I knew that name and uh, we had a chance to go see them. Um, uh, so we did. And so when you asked me to talk about Fugazi, uh, you know, the show Walnut and I went to immediately popped out. And uh, and we actually kind of talked about um, which album to go over because at the time it was, as we've kind of talked about a little bit, it was the summer of 91. So, so Steady Diet of Nothing was kind of the most current release, but they were still playing a lot of the songs off of Repeater when, when we saw them. So, I don't know. I, we I, we, we kind of settled on Repeater after throwing it back and forth. And, and uh, uh, it's just, it, to me, that's like their classic album, I, I guess. If if, we're, if Fugazi is to have a classic album, I think I think Repeater would, would probably be the one. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Um, yeah, I, I definitely, I had never... Really, I'd heard of Fugazi, but I'd never seen them mm. um, and really listened to much Minor Threat. You know, a little bit of that because of Brian and Eric, our friends from Ohio, um, who was into a lot of old hardcore, you know, from the 80s and stuff like that, like Angry Samoans and things like that, or bands like that. Um, but I'd never heard, really heard much Fugazi, just a little bit until that show. And then that show, I instantly became a fan, <laughs> you know, after that. Yeah. And had yeah, uh, to, you know, buy their stuff. And, um, you know, that's really what did it for me is that summer of 91. I think, it, didn't we figure out it was June, I guess? I think we, um, yeah, and, June. Yeah, I, and that's really... Everything, everything about that show was yeah. so uh, unique, I, I think, as far as seeing um, any kind of national touring band you know i mean i think i think before that you know in the late 80s steve we had probably gone to some 
some shows, uh, some, some bigger rock and roll shows, right? For for like an REM type band or, or something like that. And, yeah. And then we had yeah, started we to, yeah. yeah and then, then we had started to see some smaller acts uh, in Dayton at Canal mm-hmm. Street Tavern, right? So we started to get a little more familiar with with the smaller shows, not like the big giant, you know, yeah. lights, lights and smoke machine flashing rock and roll shows, but the real smaller stuff and and some yeah. of the local punk rock bands, right? Like some of the guys we went to high school with were playing at Canal Street that, that we could go see on the 18 and up nights, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so we were starting to kind yeah. of get familiar with that that whole yeah. scene and that yeah. style of music, the real small stage yeah. uh, DIY yeah. kind of stuff. So yeah, I think right. when we learned about the Fugazi show, we were like, absolutely we should go and we should go and check this out and see what it's like where did you where did you hear about it how did you you're the one who heard about the show and i don't remember you were like hey we should go check this band out uh, and, uh i wish i could tell you um i, do, I <laughs> don't know it was probably a, a long time ago <clears throat> it hey, but a long I, time I have ago. a theory about that g Ron. yeah because that would have been after um you and my freshman year at dayton and so yeah. of course we were hanging out with a lot of dc guys right because, oh okay um yeah i think well, I mean, you know could, what though but in 90 i didn't i didn't really know a lot of the dc guys i didn't okay. really learn uh, get to know them until the following fall okay all right because i yeah i was um i was up to my neck in dc guys like my friend yeah <laughs> you know, um, so i would have at least heard of them and heard that they were worth seeing so uh-huh. i mean it makes sense to me that i saw them in june of 91 because i would have heard about them from those guys yeah, no, that totally makes sense. But I don't think I had met a yeah. lot of those guys yet. Okay. I, I think I just saw a flyer probably around Canal Street or something like that. And I, I yeah. didn't recognize the name. You heard right? it from somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I, I, maybe it was from, from one of the Bagdoni brothers. I, I don't remember exactly. But yeah, um, but yeah, I remember I rolled into town. I was out of town for a week, <clears throat> actually in, in New York State, Greg, but but not not exactly your neck of the woods. I remember I rolled into town and I, I don't remember if I called you, Steve, or Walnut, sorry, or, or if you called me, but I think I remember <laughs> getting home after being gone uh-huh. for about a week and I'd be like, hey, Bugazi's playing tonight. We need to leave in a half an hour. And I was like, yeah, yes, yeah. I'm still I'm still on board. <laughs> Come and get me. So, yeah. So right. we yeah. hopped in the car well, and uh, made sure we had five bucks in our pocket to get in. And that's that's all we needed. Yeah. Yeah. And that was one thing that I remember. I remember going to that show and like, you know, there was no place to park. It was this old, you know, hall, like the it was Union called hall. electrician's hall, where, yeah. you know, it looked like it was built in the mid '60s, maybe, or something yeah, like that. I mean, it was a real plain. It looked like an old. It was not like, a rock and roll venue. No, yeah, an old like <laughs> industrial anyway. building. Yeah, I mean, that was built maybe in the '40s or '50s, uh, or, or yeah. somewhere in there. Yeah, and and like, I remember just we couldn't. It was really hard to find a place to park, so we parked in like a neighborhood that was near it and walked to the building and like yeah you know it was really quiet people were kind of hanging out but then when you got in there there was just like tons of kids i mean yeah you know and i'll say kids because we were kids and yeah. like so you know there was all there were a lot of, of kids there too i mean there was it was not a yeah. proper rock and roll establishment yeah. where, where there right. was someone checking ids and right it was all ages too because yeah. that's yeah. a big exactly. thing like, ages. yeah and, and the one five dollars you were in the door yeah well, that's one thing that really stuck out to me. I was like, wow, $5. And I'd heard, I think you told me that, yeah, they always charge five bucks. They never yeah. go beyond $5, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think they did that, you know, until the time they went on hiatus. I think so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Actually, Maybe. I think um, the research I did today, my, the, when I saw them in L.A., it was $6. Let me oh, check. okay. They, they, $6. Well, it was okay. L.A. Everything's more expensive in L.A. <laughs> the West Coast. They yeah. were cashing in. Oh, they had to get it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so we, we got in the door and there was just all kinds of people that, that we knew, you know, from, from around Dayton, you know, from the Dayton yeah. scene that was there and, um, you know, just waited for the show to start. And I remember, you know, noticing how stark it was. It was just like, you know, there wasn't any special lighting. There wasn't, you know, <laughs> you, know you know, all this, you know, flashy lights and, and, and decorations or whatever, you know, no, uh, no fireworks or anything like that. Um, no, no, no. So it reminded me, it reminded me more of like a, a small elementary school stage. Yeah, yeah, you know exactly. I mean? It was like yeah. the flags on both sides. Right. And the only thing that, that cued off that you weren't in an elementary gym, elementary school gym, yeah. was that there was a bar in the corner, I think. 
because it was part yeah. of the union hall. I don't even think the right. bar was open, but it was there. No. But, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. But there was just, you know, like uh, just fluorescent lighting above the stage, you know, yeah. just like a few, like, like a few of them were out, you know, just, you know, that kind of, that kind of scene. It just looked like right. a very used place. Yeah, yeah. Um, it did not scream rock and roll, no. It, it definitely, yeah, yeah, it definitely felt rock and roll, but not in the sense of the late, you know, late 80s, early 90s stadium shows, <laughs> yeah. you know, by any sense of the imagination. So, um, but anyway, so you can take it from there. Oh, well, so, I mean, I think yeah. that's, that's just why, um, I think as part of, uh, for me, what, what has always been kind of special about Fugazi, and, and we'll, we'll talk more specifically about this album, was just that their their total uh, DIY attitude. Yeah. You know, the whole $5 notion, setting up in a union hall to play. I mean, they, they really, mm. there was nothing, if you think of rock and roll, that screamed rock and roll about them, until they just opened up and, and blew everybody's minds with their music. And, mm. and, uh, yeah. and even if that, it wasn't like a traditional rock and roll. It, it was very much based in like, you know, kind of hardcore music but the way they the way they did things was was different it, to me it yeah. felt it felt very different it wasn't just hardcore yeah. punk rock it was they were doing something unique i thought right yeah the biggest so, thing so I the show that. steve i don't know if you remember but they, they were playing and at one point somehow me and me and uh uh Juana became a launching pad do you remember this for kids yeah yeah lining up behind <laughs> us like I, maybe about three or four or five songs in suddenly yeah. we, we realized i thought steve was hand on my shoulder and i look yeah. over at him and so there's somehow there's kids putting their hands on both of our shoulders and yeah. launching themselves off into the crowd right That's, yeah. and i don't even know how yeah. that started but i just i just yeah. remember thinking like oh well this is this is yeah never had this happen this is interesting and we'll see we'll <laughs> yeah. see where this goes <laughs> yeah well as far as like the whole sh like the show itself i mean what i remember the most is like the bass and drums i mean because i'm you know i mean the bass yeah. joe lally is just phenomenal to me I mean, he was just a phenomenal bass yeah. player. And those bass lines just really, I remember those. I mean, I remember the guitar because the guitar always sounded like, you know, a couple of beehives, like, you know, together. Yeah, you know, just yeah that, that's that a good beehive description. Sound. Yeah. And, and um, you know, I remember that. And I remember, like, everybody was just like one big wave, you know, like during, everybody was kind of swaying together and like, you know, the, and not to be cheesy, but like the crowd was all in the same plane, you know, we were all um, together, you know, just in that, that same, you know, state of mind. And um, it was just hypnotizing, really, you know, and I've always told that like to, to my wife, you know, I've told her that, you know, the recordings are not the same. It's just not the same. You know, you can't, no, no. you can't capture it. And that's why I'm just like, you know, I wish they would do some reunion shows. I don't know if they will, but, um, you know, because it's really about that live show with them, you know, to me. And it was, mm -hmm. and I remember like our friend, uh, Brian, uh, <laughs> do you remember this? He was like, he was, um, he kind of knew this girl from college that was there. And they ended up like, you know, sort of like swaying together the whole time. And like they were just so like okay. enamored by the music that she ended up going to his house afterwards, and uh, yeah, wow, yeah, you don't know, you didn't know about that, yeah, I forget her I, name. Uh, I, I don't know if I did know, but uh, Brian, yeah, I guess yeah, he I used to be like, his advantage, us, perhaps. Both of us <laughs> just kind of knew her, and then he really got to know her. So uh, um, yeah, so that that was uh, it. Was just like he said he, he it was. was the, just, it was the hypnotism you were talking about. They were both just so swept up. <laughs> <laughs> in the moment yeah and the other no, thing I, I was gonna say yeah i was gonna say well you're you're totally right about about joe the bass player is that he really brings a lot of those songs through and and starts a lot of the songs out on such a heavy groove that it's it um it yeah. almost immediately makes all of those songs you know danceable in a right. in their own kind of way you know? uh, yeah these people are, are jumping around like you, you feel yeah. that kind of groove yeah, yeah yeah it's just a it's just an energy that you don't get in any other way and um you know the other thing i remember about you were talking somebody was talking about one of the shows where somebody threw a shoe up onto the, onto the <laughs> stage well i remember there was a kid who who got on the stage and like ian mckay grabbed him by the leg and like wouldn't let him go yeah. and he was like yeah. <laughs> he was like he was just like okay if you're up here you're up here you know, and the kid looked like a <laughs> horse. 
I mean, he was just like kind of like he you could tell I felt bad for him a little bit because you could tell he was like he had regretted his decision to get up there, you know, because he just <laughs> looked really uncomfortable and embarrassed. And like because yeah, Ian just like had him with two hands like this, like two hands by the leg. And we, oh my God. <laughs> and like the kid was kind of just stumbling around his hair, you know, flopping around in his face. And he finally let him go, but it was just like, you know, this is your punishment for, you know, intruding on our, <laughs> on our space up here. This is yeah. what you get, you know, but, yeah, and I was just yeah, like, I've seen him stop shows. <laughs> yeah, I've seen him stop yeah. shows because there was some kind of a commotion going on in the audience, you know, where he just, he, he wouldn't yeah. have fights breaking out. You know, he's all for people bouncing and jumping around and doing that sort of thing but uh but yeah when, once anything became violent he would he would stop everything and and uh see that the, the people were escorted out which was always interesting to me you know it, yeah I, I think that, that isn't a, what you would expect yeah yeah. That, oh, yeah that kind of a occupational hazard to an admirable you know um to their stance about all ages shows that he yeah. really wanted you know coming out of like the youth movement of hardcore and you know, just being a kid into music and like he was into skateboarding and doing things with his friends. Um, and I think just a, a lot of very significant moments from that time that he wanted to keep the, the shows open to two kids, you know, keep <laughs> yeah. them all ages. But there's a, a drawback to that where, you know, you have these, um, you know, crazy kids for like, you know, <laughs> hyper kids. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Walnut, I mentioned when I saw him at the Palladium in, in Hollywood in 93, a kid threw a shoe and I think he got hit by the shoe. And so he stopped the show. And then he was asking, like, all right, who's, you know, he's one to <laughs> level, whose shoe is it? We want to find out, you know. And then Guy, yeah. Guy Petrodo was saying, all right, is this going to be a Cinderella scenario? Who picks the shoe? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, but he's still, they still, kept to that, you know, um, that policy of all ages, which is, you know, yeah. despite that the headaches it could afford them, they wanted to leave it open to, uh, yeah, you know, for, for kids. They do it's stick totally to policy. Admirable. They certainly do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. But when you mentioned when, when he would kick people out, he would make sure they got their money back. <laughs> he would make sure. They oh, got, really? Yeah. He'd make sure he, they got the five bucks back. So oh, really? uh, they would keep a bunch of uh, envelopes on stage with five bucks in. So if they had to kick someone out, they could just give them the envelope. <laughs> for that That's the Hollywood show, I can't remember if he, it, now I'm, I can't remember if it was at that show or if I like saw it. There's that good uh, documentary instrument, but now I'm thinking maybe he, they found the, the kid and they, they kicked him out and, but then they let him come back in. But, Maybe I'm imagining that from somewhere else, but that's totally <laughs> cool too. With you know, mm. yeah, yeah. Well, it for, another, it for the right reasons, you know. Yeah, another thing I remember at the electricians' hall show was that at one point there was some kids that came in, and I don't know if it was at capacity or something, but I remember Fugazi, like Guy and Ian, were like, "Let them in, let them in, let them come in." Oh. You know, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. you remember that? I do vaguely. Yeah, yeah. G Rod. Or Ron? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember that. And, I don't uh, know what the commotion was about. I remember seeing uh, me and you were very close to the front as they yeah. were starting to play. So I, yeah, I, I remember the commotion in the back the, at the door, but I don't, I don't know why they weren't being allowed in. Right. Yeah. But um, yeah, I do remember that. And then, uh, and then Guy at, at some point made some comment about. <laughs> And I don't know how I remember this, but he made some comment about how hard they work to make the music perfect for us. And they, <laughs> and they, and it's something about we work really hard to work on every little stitch of these songs. And I hope you appreciate it or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I don't know why I remember that part of it, but uh, that's funny. But, but, he's, yeah. but he's totally right. Like they were. Um, yeah for as informal of a setting as they always played in, right? And for informal as a, uh, a whole yeah. production as it was, right. they were tight. I mean, as musician wise, wow, they were, they were yeah. on all the time. And oh, the sound yeah. was, yeah. was really, it was, it was amazing. So he oh, wasn't yeah. lying when he said that. <laughs> oh yeah. 
Like you yeah, said, definitely. the guitars, like the 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 buzzing and and blurring guitars, always going back and forth, and the yeah, the danceable yeah. almost like driving bass, and and uh and uh, yeah. Brendan, we we decided right, the drummer, he's Brendan, even a yeah. drummer by himself. I, I mean, he would just keep those songs blaring ahead at full speed. It was it was oh yeah, it was yeah. something that had to be experienced to really feel right, to feel like the the music hitting you and to hear it and uh, and to really sweat through it it was uh, it was a hell yeah. of an experience for, and, they, and they played without a set list that was one of their policies too right no no oh, i didn't know that okay yeah. oh right. i didn't know that either huh mm. wow yeah I, I mean to me the music you know when you when you hear it live especially is always like the bass and drums were always this consistent you know bass coat of paint and then yeah, like yeah. the two guitars would just kind of overlap it you know and they just overlap each other like a couple of swarming bees yeah. And, uh, you know, just, but, um, you know, and um, just the passion, you know, the passion that's in it in the vocals and stuff too is, and scream singing at its best. I mean, Kurt Cobain <laughs> was really good at that, but I mean, they were also extremely good at scream singing. You know, <laughs> it's so, true, yeah. Yeah, so. It may take a little, but, a little bit of getting used to for some people, but, but it actually, it actually works for what they were doing. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah, I know some people that like never really got into them, you know, just because it wasn't their style. But, sure. you know, everybody's obviously everybody's different, you know, in that sense. But for me, it was like, um, you know, the live show is what catapulted me into yeah. just listening to the music. So uh, the yeah. recorded music to this day, <laughs> to this day. So, right, yeah, right. I, yeah, I'm just waiting for them to reunite. I follow uh, Brendan Canty on uh instagram and he's always like showing pictures of nature like by his house and i'm just like wow that's a really pretty tree what about fukazi <laughs> 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 wow that's a great piece of scenery fukazi <laughs> yeah. yeah because uh they never officially br broke up right it's just a hiatus no right it's a hiatus, yeah, hiatus. But yeah, I don't know. Hmm. yeah since what yeah. 2003 i think Right, something like that. Uh, probably, yeah. It's been yeah. a while. Indefinite hiatus since 2003. Um, so, Dave, you're saying it seems like you uh, you probably saw them play two or so nights after me and Steve saw them play in Dayton. Yeah, yeah and yeah. you saw them in Cleveland. So we figured out that you guys saw them June 11th in Dayton. Yeah, and so we're talking about 91. Um, well, I uh, I wanted to mention this just um. Right, as we mentioned, they have all these policies about, you know, uh, the tickets will only be $5 and, you know, no set lists, all ages. But also they would not sell merchandise. At no, show, never. Right? Um, so right. they didn't have an official T-shirt. So these kind of bootleg T-shirts kind of became really popular in the early 90s, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's not a Fugazi yeah. shirt. Yeah. I remember seeing the movie with my, with my son watching um, School of Rock. With, with Jack Black. Did you see that film? <laughs> yeah. Yes, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 And like, there's, there's a scene where he's like laying in his room on his mattress, passed out. And like above his head is a Fugazi sticker. And I was like, those didn't exist. How <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> where did yeah. he get that? They never, those never existed. I mean, you know, maybe they just made him for the movie, but <laughs> so, but no, you're just, right. Yeah. Dory, like somehow this t shirt became so popular that, um, Oh, I don't remember the whole story, but um, somehow Ian figured out who was doing this and they and they just had to agree to donate a, a good portion of the money to charities. And they ultimately got Ian's blessing to make these t-shirts. Oh, so, wow. Okay. Yeah, if um, anyone wants to research that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I was going to tell. Yeah, so this is two nights later. Look, this is June 13th, 91. Oh, yeah. $5, of course. Um, so this is at a place called Flashes, just a, a bar. I think they usually had heavier bands play there. But hmm. look at this night. They had 1,300 kids, right? 13, oh, my God. Wow. Right? Um, and so this is what I remember about this show. So I, this, so I took this from Fukazi's website. They have a nice archive of, you know, their live shows and a lot of information about the shows. Um, and people commenting. So look what this guy says here. This remains one of my favorite shows of all time. I remember it well. The club, uh, the real Flash Gordons, was incredibly hot. 
Okay, so hmm. this is <clears throat> crucial to my story here. And then this guy chimed in five months ago. Uh, huh. I second that this was the hottest show ever. I ended up standing on a table because there was an air conditioning vent above it. They just kept letting people into the club. Oh my God, so, <laughs> so hot in there, right? Wow. <laughs> and um, see, this is what I remember about it. Like I was yeah, excited to see Fugazi. I'd heard the buzz. Um, but, you know, I didn't expect there to be 1,300 people. <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> seems like a lot to me. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, yeah, so I, when I was a kid, I used to have, um, sometimes I would get like kind of heat exhaustion type mm. symptoms. Um, I especially remember when I was an altar boy, when I was a kid and I would, <laughs> I would have to, I would have to stand, nice for a, stand for a long time, like in these robes, you know? Yeah. And, um, <laughs> There was was at least two or three times that I passed out on the altar, right? Because I was standing too cool. long, like in these, especially if you're holding a a candle or something, and like kind of the hot lights are on you. Like um, huh. it happened to me. Yeah, I'm gonna say at least two or three times when I was a kid, I passed out while being an Holy altar boy, and it was I uh, mm -hmm. quit being an altar boy because of that. But I remember exactly <laughs> how it felt to pass out. Right, like you kind of break out in a cold sweat, and then you start to see red, and then you're huh. just screwed. You're going down, right? Oh no! And it, you know, once I get outside, you know, then I'm fine. Like when it happened, like somebody would just take me out out of the church, and I'd kind of come to outside, and I'd you know take a few breaths of air, and I'd be fine, right? But I, um, but yeah, it happened to me a few times growing up. I vividly remember how it felt. And so at this show, this hot show with 1,300 kids. Oh, no. And, um, <laughs> you know, there was no way. <laughs> um, there's no, there was, ah, there's no easy way for me to get out of there, right? So I'm in the middle of the show and I started getting that feeling, that cold sweat. Oh, God. And I'm seeing oh, red. No. And, um, yeah, and I, I just knew, I knew I was just, I was going down. Right. And so I was going to pass out in the middle of this kind of crisis. So this is the following night in right. Pittsburgh. This is uh, also taken from the wow. web. This is, uh, they said they had 1,350 kids here. Right. Wow. But I think it, wow. it gives you an idea. I was about to pass out like in this environment. Right. Oh, my God. Yeah. And um, so my friend, the great. <laughs> Jake Baker, right? Hey. <laughs> or Jakub Akinski, as he's also known. Um, yeah, he put me, Jake put me on his back and uh, carried me through this. Oh, my God. Are you serious? Wow. In the middle of the concert with all these kids going crazy, he carried me through this to the, to the door. And um, I just, you know, the whole time I'm, you know, cold sweat, I'm seeing red. Um, I remember the door just looked like, God, if I could just get there and get some air, I'm going to be okay. Cause I want, I didn't want to miss the show. I think I'd seen most of it. Right. But, um, yeah, yeah, I, I had, I needed air. And, uh, I remember <laughs> we got near the door and some guy screaming, you guys are either in or you're out. And, um, yeah, I think Jake took me outside or either I just, maybe I walked outside and Jake went back, but, uh, yeah, he got me through to safety to the door through this mad yeah. wow. <laughs> way to go jake yeah, wow. yeah no kidding. good god yeah. you would have been in yeah. trouble so if you would hit the floor yeah. there yeah. yeah 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 so you didn't pass out outside or anything no once okay? i got it once i got outside yeah. i was okay i knew i just needed air but um yeah but yeah i missed the remainder of the show but um but yeah, what did you like, think of the show up until your yeah, oh, I mean, your seeing red, cold yeah. sweat point? Yeah, I mean, awesome, yeah. just in, intense and crazy, and I just no, yeah, I didn't expect I didn't expect that many fan. I mean, I I like I said, I was probably recommended Fugazi by the DC guys I knew. I would think mm -hmm. that's why the name was in my head, and uh, I didn't. I don't know if I knew I was going to like this huge cultural event i think i was just yeah. going, going to see a cheap show you know so um yeah it was pretty uh yeah pretty intense pretty intense hey sylvia yeah hey, happy birthday hey, sylvia 
Bye. They're telling you happy birthday. Oh, thank you. Happy birthday. <laughs> happy oh, wow. Birthday. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so hats hats off to Jake. And that was at the, the height of his uh, Tom Hanks lookalike. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um that's a great shirt by the way yeah wow. <laughs> yeah hound's um, tooth <laughs> we could uh yeah we could talk about um the dayton show but greg when was your show in la we could do it um we could do um, it chronologically do you think it was uh 93 it was april 23rd 1993 okay let's let's so before uh, this one yeah let's hear your story Oh, well, geez, David, pales in comparison to the, 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 the emergency that you had <laughs> being, being rushed to uh, safety. That's an amazing story. Um, so, yeah, I was, I was doing, uh, I was in this thing called the Jesuit Volunteer Corps, like a kind of domestic peace corps, year of volunteering. So I was living in San Pedro, home of, of Mike Watt, um, and, um, uh, working at the Legal Aid Foundation of Long Beach, so but it was it was cool. I, um, it was a great experience. Um, and then I had a friend I went to college with, Scotty, who was in LA. So, yeah, we we both knew about Fugazi, and and so we I didn't have much money, you know. Uh, in this volunteer program, they just gave you a stipend each month, and um, but yeah, it was. A, Six bucks, I think it said on the thing, but still, Fugazi show very cheap. And you know, I didn't. Uh, well, the first rock concert I ever went to was the Ramones live at Buff State, Buffalo State College in '85. Wow, '85. Wow. Um, so I was a freshman in high school, but I wasn't familiar with the Ramones really. So it was just kind of this noise at the bottom <clears throat> of the hill, but it was a real. <laughs> It, it was a, it was quite a quite a, a show, um, but anyways, I didn't you know I wasn't familiar with like hardcore bands. I didn't go to any hardcore shows. You know, I if I was very invested in in classic rock through college. You know, and I'll even um, admit I, I was getting into like Blues Traveler and Spin Doctors through. <laughs> um, through my time in, in, in college. So, but I had heard waiting room. So that, that sold me on Fugazi. And so Scotty was into them. So we went, so just to see like, you know, Fugazi is a post hardcore band and this all ages show with all these, and we were up in the balcony of the Palladium. So to see a, a mosh pit and a crowd of kids. And then I remember like, a circle of kids running around the mosh pit. And it was just, it, it seemed to be, you know, bedlam. And, but it, like you said, a cultural event. It was kind of, yeah. I mean, it was like, and after the Ramon show the next year, that summer, friends, uh, the, the Grateful Dead came to Buffalo with, with Tom Petty. I think it was the 4th of July, 1986. So that was my first Grateful Dead show. So that was that was an experience, um, you know. Um, so it was kind of like that, though, and a you know different, and a, obviously younger and, and different scene. Um, so I was totally intrigued. Um, and then yeah, there was you know one kid threw the sh threw a sneaker on stage, and then they stopped the show. So you generally don't have that kind of drama at a you know rock show. <laughs> no. And. Uh, um, and, you know, it, um, and I wish I was more familiar with the music. I think I had, I don't even know if I had 13 songs. I knew I, I loved Waiting Room, but I don't know if I had 13 songs yet. But yeah. I was just um, so intrigued by the whole event that um, I kept, kept up on Fugazi and, um, you know, then 13 songs and Red Medicine really got me into it. And I remember too, like sending away for a Discord catalog when I was in my, after college, I was in my twenties back in Buffalo. I had a little more disposable income so I could, you know, buy so like a, You had to mail away for it? Is that what it was? You had to like send a little postcard yeah, or something? 
around the, in my twenties, <laughs> I really got got more into kind of underground music, like indie rock. I remember sending away for like the the K Records uh, oh. scene too, catalog, which were, and they had little articles in there about kind of political things, hmm. political commentary. So, so they were they were they were, they were very uh, educational, and the the Discord one was so cool. It was like long. Um, it was like long rectangle, you know, you'd open it up like this. They had these really, um, it was more um, vertical than horizontal is what I'm trying to say. And I remember hmm. uh, Lungfish, where I'm getting off Fugazi here, but hmm. Lungfish was a band that was on Discord. The main guy, Daniel oh. Higgs, is a real character. Oh, Greg, when, um, sorry to interrupt you, but that show I'm sorry, talked about before when I saw Smog play in Japan in a temple with oh, Joanna with, Newsom. Yeah, yeah. Lungfish was there. That guy, Daniel Higgs, was there too. Yeah. Oh. And I remember, I wish yeah. I still had it. Oh, um, sorry, go ahead. I think when I went to Japan, my mom threw away like a bunch of my stuff. But um, there was a great picture in this, in this uh, vertical, this very long catalog of of Daniel Higgs from Lungfish. And uh, this was like the mid nineties. He had tattoos on his hands and he had like a walker and he had a big beard, you know. Oh, I um, <laughs> wow, and, wow, interesting dude. Yeah, so just that, you know, I think that got me more into Fugazi and Fugazi being in, you know, an entry point for Discord Records and the, the scene in DC, which, they're a big yeah, part which of is it. very unique, you know. Yeah, I think yeah. the so, whole DC is is very encapsulated. It has a, very much its own sound. Hmm. With with Fugazi kind of heading that charge, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah and they still do, I think, as far as I know. The the there still is a DC sound, you know. Um, you know, Discord is still very much alive. So you can. The funny thing is, is you can get any of those records like for pretty damn cheap, like yeah. on vinyl. <laughs> on discord still right. if you wanted to get repeater on vinyl you could mail away for it right or just you know buy it online right now you know for like 10 bucks or really? something wow. that's so good. yeah wow wow that's awesome wow, that's awesome yeah and fugazi had um opportunities to make big money in the 90s right like they they were oh, they i'm were, sure they did like major labels yeah. that were trying to recruit yeah them. um there was an article i think mojo did an article dave Somewhat recent, but I think uh, Ahmet Ertigin, you know, mm. the, that's it. Yeah. One of the, him and his brother were the head honchos of Atlantic Records that they mm. were, um, what's the word? Uh, wooing, trying to yeah. sign Fugazi. Sporting. You know. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah, sporting. <laughs> Thank you, Walnut. <laughs> um, you know, I think post, you know, Nirvana, but uh, no, they didn't. Mm. Yeah. They didn't do it. And, yeah. Which I mean, yeah, there was a few labels courting them, and they they didn't want they just didn't want to do it. They felt like Discord was good enough, yeah. and you know they were they were you know making what they needed to make from Discord, and they liked having their own label. So yeah, they stuck with it. Yeah, they could have they could have signed to you know Warner Brothers probably or whoever, mm. you know, and they just decided not to do that. I think it's a it you know I mean it's it's very admirable, and they're almost like. You know, you can get this perspective of them as like saints, you know, or just, you know, these, these altruistic individuals. But I know Ian Mackay has said like, well, we want to create this environment and and do this on a level that we're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and I think it's just a personal interest in that way. Like, we, you know, we don't want, they realize that if they were signed to a label, they'd lose a lot of control. And then they'd be part of this really big production um, and it's, as far as financially, I think that it's worked out for them, you know, they, yeah, they probably, you know, their house yeah, I mean, they obviously didn't cash in, they, they're not yeah, sure, but they're rolling in, in money, but they're obviously comfortable, you know. Yeah, yeah. And they're. Well, and I think they, they unintentionally created their own lore, you know, about themselves, yeah. you know. Yeah. I think that it's not, you know, it's not something that they wanted to do, but in some ways it's almost like, you know, it's helped them <laughs> be even bigger than, you know, yeah. than they would like to be probably, you know, but, you know, that's just what happens, you know, when you kind of, you know, have all of these, 
uh, different nuances about yourself, you know, and, you know, I, like I said, they didn't intentionally do that. I think it's just the way it happened. Yeah, so, yeah probably yeah. so. They, they just wanted to, like you were saying, Greg, they just wanted to do things the way they wanted to do them. They had really no interest right. in turning over that control to somebody who was then going to tell them how to dress or what to play or, you know, any of that. Yeah. They had no interest in it. They just wanted to do it themselves. And if that meant playing in, you know, an old falling down union hall in Dayton, Ohio, that they were cool with that, you know, and, and I respect yeah. that. That, that. That's a great, that's a great way to, to well, conduct themselves. Yeah. And then major labels also, you, you know, a lot of, a lot of times you have to sign a contract to where, you know, you owe us right. three or four albums, you know, right. no matter what. Right. And they probably just didn't want to get into that. You know, we yeah, want to do I it don't on think our so. own terms. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, okay. Uh, yeah, we're going to play a video quick just to, um, for the uninitiated who may not be familiar with Fugazi, just to get a feeling of what they were like live. Uh, this is a clip from 91 playing um, in D.C. outside in front of the White House, right? Or... The mall area, DC, you think? Um, and the White House. Greg, you were saying it's a it's a protest against the the Gulf War. Yes. Okay. All right. So let's check it out. It's the first track off the album, Turnover. Right. And it's another example of them kind of playing in an unconventional setting. I mean, the stage looks like a bunch of two by fours nailed together. So. <laughs> let's check it out. Mm -hmm. Stop culture of That's great. Just to just to give you an idea, right? Yeah, the music sounds great, but looking at that at that show, all I can think of is it looks very cold in DC cold. on that day. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but the sound great. Yeah, awesome. Hmm. You get a feel. Yeah, I couldn't oh. tell exactly where it was. Was it in front of the White House? I, I think later in the clip you can kind of see the White yeah. House in the background. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm. Yeah. Um yeah, and you can see just how in sync they, you know, in sync they are with each yeah. other, right? Even the kind oh, of yeah, yeah. double front oh, yeah. band, double lead guitarist type thing works, yeah. you know? 
Yeah. yeah, but again, it starts out with that bass sound, right? Like the bass kind of like laying down the groove that the whole song is going to get kind of layered on top of, which which is which is awesome. I think that's just kind of how they how they construct their songs, which is always has worked for me. <laughs> it sounds awesome. I I really love the beginning of that song with the guitar effects. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it sounds yeah. like uh, like early morning in DC or something. Like the lights are just coming on, or you know, oh, or like yeah. it's just kind of like or like uh, dawn. But it's such a cool guitar effect. I, I really don't know how they do it, but um, that kind of backwards, you know, those sound effects. I thought it was a keyboard, but you know, when I first heard it, but then the more I listened to it, I'm like, that's a guitar. Um, but that's that's a really cool that's a really cool beginning to the album too a repeater yeah uh, you know and i was it's reading that originally on into it originally on turnover i guess um ian mckay sang lead on that um hmm. back when they were before Guy, and uh and then turned it over to Guy. turned <laughs> turned it over sorry huh. to Guy. uh <laughs> at a later time when he joined so okay yeah so he wrote that one a while back before they put it on repeater. So, but yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Very yeah. Cool. Yeah. That intro caught my ear too. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty experimental. And I think that um, it is something that I admire and some, you know, people talk about them being a post hardcore band. So they have that energy from, you know, yeah. from their hardcore days but they were you know they, they weren't stuck in any convention and right. willing to um you know yeah. expand and push the envelope and you know look for new sonic adventures oh for sure yeah there was a lot of you know for a hardcore band too i mean they used a lot of like especially i noticed in um shut the door which is i mean to move on to the last tune but there's a lot of set like seventh chords and stuff like jazz chords in that. Yeah. Which is really cool. I mean, it's just like, you don't hear that in punk. I mean, there's some really interesting chords um, in that song. And that's definitely one of my favorites. I mean, the lyrics and everything, I'm, huh. you know, I mean, I don't listen to Fugazi specifically for lyrics a lot of the times, but, but that one is, is just so powerful with the, she's not breathing, you know, um, I guess it was about like the crack epidemic, mm. you know, in DC. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, the, the jazz, I don't know, I don't know if it was Ian or Yee, but there's definitely a jazz influence with some of the tunes. Yeah, I think so too. You even hear a little bit of that with merchandise, I think, Steve, like in, in, yeah. in pieces here and there. And I always think that's kind of strange too, that there'd be some kind of jazz influence thrown into that mix because i don't i don't think i don't feel like it comes from ian based on his background right yeah i don't know if it comes from the you would think it would come from the uh, bass and drum duo one of those two guys or maybe both yeah. would have some, some jazz influence to be able to pull that off i, I don't know but yeah i was yeah. i was going to mention that too that that's it's, yeah. it's just a hint of it thrown in there. They're certainly not playing jazz by any means, but there's there's something in there which <laughs> kind of leans it in that direction. Yeah. yeah. I mean, with Joe Lally, I, he might have had a, back, a jazz background because, I mean, he he definitely, you know, <clears throat> does some really, you know, com complex fingerings, you know, compared to typical punk. Yeah. You know, I mean, he's, um, it's almost like funk and there's just a lot of, it, you know, ska a little bit. I mean, there's a lot of influence in there. Yeah, I you agree. Know, yeah. A lot of, yeah, different things peppered in. So, and the, I don't do you know want to start in, the, in yeah. the instrument video? But somewhere he he talks about it, Ian approached him about starting Minor Threat and you know, or I'm starting Fugazi and playing music together. And he mentions, I'm pretty sure he mentions James Brown along with the Stooges and okay, and yeah, some, like dub stuff. But you know, yeah. I think that harkens back to that groove and, and maybe yeah. some funk and, you know, uh, and some, you know, being open yeah. to different types of music outside of punk. Or the yeah. hardcore they came up with. Well, I'm cool. sure they all grew up. I mean, they all grew up in the 70s. You can't help but hear funk, like yeah. 70s <laughs> funk. <laughs> you know, meters oh, and, and then, all that. You know, there's you know. A, uh, there was a, a, funk, a funk scene in 
in DC called Go Go Music. Mm -hmm. Really, I think I heard about through through the the makeup, which was a D, you know um, Ian Sabonius yeah. from Nation of Ulysses, and they use he. I don't know. I read an interview with him, or maybe in one of their records, they talk about Go Go Music. But in that Nardwar video, I, I mentioned the Ian Mackay interview. He talks about the Go Go Music. It, type of <laughs> funk that was played in dc and they were they would go see he played shows with um this one go-go band um and he said he was he was quite into go-go music it was primarily african-american bands and he had a pretty big collection of their stuff so who's wow, the one okay. guy greg there's especially one guy they say is like the king of that do, do you know who? Go -Go. Oh, from the king of go yeah that would be belinda go -Go. carlisle i think no no <laughs> I don't know. I, um, yeah, and then um, somebody, I think the past couple of years, a go go music guy died. And I think James McNew from Yola Tango or Yola Tango retweeted something. But I don't know. I don't know. Maybe that's huh. what I'm thinking of Chuck uh, or Charlie, somebody or other. But um, hmm. yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's see. Continuing with our, uh, yeah, history. Hey, you want to throw on another song? Yeah. Um, well, I guess since I put this up, Greg, let me talk. To, or, oh, yeah. G. Ron, let me talk through here. So a couple, yeah, this was two summers later. Uh, I saw them in Dayton. Uh, and this time it was uh, outside. So this would have been just before classes started uh, my senior year. Yeah. Yep. In Dayton. And uh, you were with me, right, G. Ron? Or you? I was. Uh, I was at that one for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, and well, for me, it was kind of a nicer experience because it was not an you know overly crowded you know <laughs> <laughs> ridiculously <laughs> hot place. Ridiculously yeah. Ridiculously hot place. It was. It was outside. Um, yeah, eight hundred fifty people. Yeah, and I remember this just being great. Like they played, um, and they played a much longer set. Yeah. Than they did um, uh, two years before. So it was, um, yeah, I think they had kind of um, grown in, um, they were becoming a bigger band. Yes. Yeah? So they were just, they were, um, this festival was really about them, I felt, right? So they, if you, like on the oh, website, they were definitely they, the, the headliners if there was, if there was one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and they they played like thirty songs, right? If you look at this whole uh, page <laughs> website, really? Wow. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I mean, I, I remember this just this just being great. Were there any? Yeah, other, so it, <coughs> it says on there was a benefit for the them? new space. Yeah. Were, were um, there any local Dayton bands with them? Do you remember? So this band, fifteen, which for some reason I remember. <laughs> I don't know why. Oh, oh but Cage, Joe Nick Cazotis' band. So yep. Cage, Cage were um, they were a Dayton band? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. See, I remember. Yeah. I mean, they. When I look back at a lot of old stuff, I go, I went to Cage was the opening band. So I feel like I need to see a picture of them or something to jog my memory. But um, this band yeah. fifteen was from uh, San Francisco or Berkeley area. Hmm. I do not remember that. I just I vaguely remember them. I don't I don't know why, but um. Yeah, it was uh, Fugazi <laughs> in the height of their glory, right? 93, right? And kind of. Yeah, like, pretty much. Just outdoor, beautiful day, you know, long show, just great, great stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Now, they played at nighttime, Dave? No, I think, it, I feel like it was. Is, is, that, is that picture not from, because it looks like they're playing yeah. under a tent at nighttime. Is that for. I. I remember being there in the day, but maybe it was such a long, uh, you know, show that it was getting dark, you know. Yeah, or I, I yeah. definitely remember seeing part of the show while the sun was still up, though. Absolutely. So when they started, it was still it was still light. I know that. So kind of an early show, really. I mean, yeah, comparatively, yeah. it might just be the picture too. That, that yeah, yeah, the lighting um, in the picture. Yeah, I remember it being light though. So, um, yeah, they're not wearing their masks in the picture. I know. Masks. They, must have, they must have just taken their masks off. Oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that was Boy. another age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no kidding. Yeah. In many ways. <laughs> <laughs> another lifetime. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. 93, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, all right, I thought we could look at the, the track listing, right? We've discussed uh, turnover. So uh, yeah, knock yourselves out, guys. Yeah, so I, I was, you know, obviously perusing back through a lot of the albums over the last week or so. And I think, I think on repeater for me, I think a couple of my favorites have always been merchandise and styrofoam. Styrofoam, I think, is, you know, goofy name, but it's, a, I, yeah. it's always been a great song to listen to. Oh, and so, so relevant today. Wait, where's that bit of lyrics? In there? Yeah, the, I was like, thinking the exact still, same thing. Still relevant. We are all bigots, so filled yeah. with hatred. We release yeah. our poisons. We are all bigots, so full with hatred. We release our poisons like styrofoam. I wrote yeah. down the same quote. Yeah. <laughs> to me, it's like a, it's almost dystopian. It's like um, it's like after some, you know, after. I mean, he mentions race. I don't know if he's talking about like a rat race or if he's talking about race, like race race. <laughs> I think <laughs> or he's talking about like, race. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, rate, you know, but it's almost like dystopian after some kind of war, you know, that, you know, every, you know, that this is, you know, we, we ended up here because we're all bigots and couldn't get past it, you know, and that's kind of what I see in that tune. But as far as, um, you know, the bass and drums, it's just so, I mean, that's one of my favorites. It's just so driving. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah. so, I mean, it's just such a cool bass and drum song. Um, yeah, but the lyrics on that one are definitely very fitting for today. <laughs> but um, what were you right, saying, right. Uh, Alrod, about your, about your favorites? Oh well, well uh, I mean, those two are those two. I think for me are my favorite on that album, merchandise and and styrofoam. Um, yeah. But really, I mean, you, you almost can't go can't go wrong with the album. I, I mean, that's I think that's why it's it's pretty much one of their to be considered their classics. I mean, yeah, every song is good. It's just that there's some that are kind of better than the others, which are still good. <laughs> it's, you you, you yeah. really can't. Go wrong. There, there is one I can't um, off the top of my head. I can't remember the name. There is one which kind of sticks out like an oddball. It's like a, a slow instrumental, I think. And I always found that one was a little weird. If I'm thinking of the right one, um, is it Blueprint or no? It, might be. it must um, be because I know Steve Fisted find um, it, it might be Blueprint that starts out like a little more mellow and quiet. Yeah, and, right? yeah. they always kind of had yeah. those. You know, it was kind of their heavy metal ballad, you know, that was always, a, a, you know, yeah. always on like a hair metal band. They'd always have the one ballad. I guess that was <laughs> their, like, one calm song to have on every album. I, I don't know. I would have never thought of that, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of my favorite, one sticks re really sticks out for me is Brendan One because, oh, yeah. I mean, it's an instrumental, but it sounds like an early U2 song. It sounds like something from War um, huh. to me. Okay. And like, that's the one that sounds just, it's real anthemic. And I picture the whole crowd like bouncing in unison to that song. I mean, it's just, I, it's, an, but you know, it's one of the best instrumentals, I think, um, that they do. So, cool. and then um, I obviously repeater is awesome. Um, I oh, love sure. the drums, the drums on that, I mean, it are incredible because he starts off like with the snare drum off. And it's real like like tribal sounding, you know. And then like later in the song, he turns the snare drums back on, the snares on, and it's got more of a punchy sound. So it yeah, starts yeah. off like the drums definitely change like in the middle of the song, if you listen to it. And um, that's one that is is interesting to me that Ian and Ian is credited for singing it, but Guy or Guy and Ian sing in unison, I think, on that one, which is really neat. I think so too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's the one also. Repeater, right? Is the one where they they uh, they've got the bell, the kind of like iconic bell during that song. Yeah, really. that's in there too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and that's been, yeah. And I'll mention for for Dave and Greg's benefit. Uh, Steve is uh, Walnut. Walnut is is uh, by nature a drummer. So if, if he focuses on some of the drumming aspects, that's that's uh, yeah. that's kind of the world he, oh, yeah, yeah. he comes from. He played in a, a lot of bands in Dayton on drums. But yeah. has since also uh, picked up guitar and, and plays a lot of guitar now too. So if I didn't yeah. mention that earlier, uh, he's he, one that's probably going to be focused on drums. I would say it's a, on a lot of these <laughs> yeah. songs. That's welcome. Yeah, we've we've had drummers on before. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and of course, yeah, Buffalo Greg being a drummer. Oh, I didn't yeah. realize that, Greg. Oh, really? All right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Great. Yeah. 
Um, cool. We should talk about that another time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> talk drums. <laughs> What's the, um, what was the um, Homer Simpson talking about uh, his favorite band, Grand Funk Railroad? David, <laughs> was it yes. the shirtless lyrics of Mark Farner? Or the competent <laughs> drumming? Hey. <laughs> I'm somewhere between a semi-competent and competent drummer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mentioned on Greed, track number seven, you hear that bell. And yeah. Oh, is that the one? Okay, all right. Yeah, that's the one. But it could be on, on repeater too, but um, as I was listening before the show, it, it, I definitely heard it. And I was wondering because uh, um, when I... <clears throat> Not in Holly. I don't think he had an. I remember seeing them in Rochester around the time of Red Medicine, like '96, I guess. Mm. And him setting it, you know, having a, a fairly typical rock drum set. But then on the one stand, that old bell. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He had and that. It it, it, yeah. it figures pretty heavily, I think, or significantly in uh, Red Medicine, and then the end hits. Um, and so, uh, and so when I heard, it, I was like, oh yeah, the bell. And you know, he, Brendan Canty played uh, as part of the MC50, where the 50th anniversary of the MC5 oh. first record. It's really? Wayne, Wayne Kramer, the lone surviving member. And he had Brendan Canty on drums. He's had like a kind of revolving door of, of uh, you know, <clears throat> notable musicians, but the, guitarist from Soundgarden, Kim Thale oh. was in the band. I saw him in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and uh, Brendan had the bell. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> awesome. awesome. Yeah. I love the bell. Yeah, the bell's great. It's, it yeah. really is. To me, it's usually the music comes to a halt when he hits that bell, you know? <laughs> like, it just lets it reverberate for a little bit, and then they go yeah, back yeah. in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's, you know, obviously something didn't pick up at the local drum store you know and you know he found that at a flea market or somebody's basement and you know, right and then <laughs> rigged it yeah, up yeah it's definitely it definitely works I yeah mean, it works with his kit so well but um were you talking to greg or uh, <laughs> l rod g rod ron were you talking about two beats off <laughs> kind of metal? the one that's like uh it's like dun 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 dun. It almost sounds like a car chase. And then yeah, yeah, I think that's one. It does in a way, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like a yeah, it sounds like a like a seventies car chase or something to me. And then Guy sounds kind of alien, like oh, that's awesome. I think I think I'd have to. Yeah, he sings kind of over. I think I'd have to put that one on to hear it to kind of. hang on. See, I think it's okay. like a, just a testament to what a good album is. It is, and um, how it functions as a whole piece. That like even you know hardcore fans are having a hard time identifying which bits of it they want to talk about. You know, I think well, I, and I think most of the time I listen to this album, Dave, mm -hmm. was in my car mm -hmm. off the cassette, yeah. and there was no you know skipping around from song to song. Sure, if you were listening to it, you were listening to the whole album. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The whole way through. Well, those, hey, those so. are where the best albums are, anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, about yeah, styrofoam. Back to styrofoam really quickly because I think it's interesting. Of course, he's talking about bigotry, but you kind of like. I like that he also you know adds that bit about we release our poisons like styrofoam. So he's also talking about damaging the environment. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Concisely, he's mentioning like two issues. You know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's very efficient that way. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Merchandise. Yeah, I liked. I thought it was a good message to hear as a young person. You know, um, yeah, like just merchandise. Yeah, you are not what you own, you know. As right, we, right. Yeah. We yep. were that age coming out of college, you know, thinking we're what we want out of life, right? But just that idea, because I don't know if I had heard that from anyone else that like, yeah, <laughs> you're, being, you're being targeted and manipulated to buy right. certain things, to think certain right. things, to, you know. Yeah. Like you're being yeah. sold to, right. Yeah. yeah. Merchandise. Yep. I think I... And I, David, I'm uh, just interject. Oh, sorry, interrupting. Um, I think I saw that first on a T-shirt. 
but it may be on a, a oh a you boot, like what you are the, not what you own is that what you yeah, mean yeah and oh, it, it okay. totally resonated huh. either someone someone had maybe a bootleg fugazi t-shirt um but or a, a bumper stick i remember seeing that and yeah it's huh. uh, totally resonated cool. um, yeah i don't think i heard this song that i remember until today <laughs> oh wow disclosure yeah <laughs> um verse so, two yeah. verse two from that song right merchandise it keeps us in line common sense says it's by design what could a businessman ever want more than to have us sucking in his store yeah so just like <laughs> that idea like that yeah it's like all these people yeah. are working together to target you you know, to make right. you obedient to their needs, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. That's another one. I really like Ian's vocals. They're real anthemic. He, he always has... I like Guy's vocals, but I've always really liked Ian's. Mm. Um, just they're always yeah. just so anthemic and melodic. And, um, and Merchandise is another one that's just... I'm a big... And I'm still a big fan of the police. And, and like, <laughs> it, a lot of it follows that police you know, driving bass and drums, you know, um, that's just a real, that's a real fantastic song as far as um, dynamics, like the instruments dropping in and out, you'll just have like a, a single guitar by itself, you know, playing and, um, you know, or just like the drums do a little fill by themselves, but they, it just, that's what's fascinating to me about Fugazi in general, is just the overlapping of all the different instruments. Hey. So, <laughs> I just saw your kid with a cat. Yeah, that was Nico heading upstairs. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> so, do, do you see a, a thread, I guess, because the um, the police were heavily influenced by reggae, right? Yeah. So do you see that also through... I do. Ozzy? Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's actually a little bit of, um, you know, Scott, not as much with Fugazi, but yeah, with um, some of the drumming techniques and stuff like that, um, Brendan Canty had to have listened to Stuart Copeland. I mean, I don't know, <laughs> maybe, maybe not a lot. I don't know if he was a big fan, but if you're a drummer, I mean, most drummers from the 80s really like Stuart Copeland, if you're a rock drummer. So, um, me included. And so I, I think Brendan Canty, just by his style, um, and how tight everything is, he had to have listened to some <laughs> of Stewart's drumming techniques and followed that. So, yeah, I, I hear a thread. <laughs> yeah, probably more ska than than reggae, but but yeah, but yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, again, it goes back to the groove that they're able to, to establish in almost every song. You know, it's yeah, absolutely. It's, just, it's not just like hardcore straight ahead, just plow through the song as loud and as fast as you can. I mean, there's there's a definite groove that's set up which gets everybody moving and, and carries the oh, song yeah. it's awesome everybody moving 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 yeah there you go yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah but you know i think as far as my favorites on this on the album i think shut the door is mm -hmm. definitely one of them i just think it's got such such a cool um subject i mean it's not a good subject but um <laughs> just the the base on that and um it's just such a it's just such a heavy sounding song to me it sounds like somebody's got cinder blocks on each feet foot and they're just stomping um hmm. but yeah it's it's uh well i even wonder sometimes if that song is like a different tuning than some of their other tunes it's just so different to me so shut the door hmm. that, shut the door yeah that's a really good one it's by far the longest uh, song on the album or yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, I think it's close to five minutes while most of them are two or right. Three. That is yeah. pretty weird, then. Yeah, huh. I'm playing it right now. Yeah, no, <laughs> I broke the surface. So, yeah, I slow that a bit. Yeah, hmm. Do you want to? Uh, <laughs> it's got a little bit of rage against the machine, I think. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, maybe Dave can put it on. I, I can't hear it so well on, on your side. One. Okay, we're going to listen to a bit of uh, Shut the Door, which is, well, it's 
it's the last song of the album, but on many of the albums, they tack those bonus three songs on the end, right? Right. So, uh, yeah. So, strictly speaking, it's yeah, the closer do. of repeater, but yeah, on many versions of repeater, there's still three more songs. And, and right. were the three extra songs just like B-sides? Is that what they are? I think it was an EP. Oh, it was a whole other EP. Okay. So, like, at every turn, they're giving their fans a little bonuses and perks <laughs> uh, all right let's let's check this out oops i put on the wrong song <laughs> yeah, it's the one right before it. Yeah. After all that. All right, wait, wait, wait. Uh, <laughs> we can't uh, manage work like this. Uh, That's why I use Monday.com. My team uses it to manage projects. There we go. Shut the door. You can almost hear that blues. So heavy. a heavy, heavy kind of plotting song, but but it is very good. And, and Steve, you're right. The the guitar, the tunings are strange. It's almost like a pre Brainiac, you know, detuning, yeah. and the two it guitars is. that kind of clash, but but it still sounds good, even though they, they're kind of yeah. clashing with each other. Well, yeah, especially it's... during the uh, she's not breathing part, I cannot figure out what the hell they're playing. There. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like they're definitely a, a low tuning, but. Unless they're just playing some weird chords, I don't know. But it's yeah. cool. I mean, it's a great tune. It's a great tune. But yeah, that that song and um, and Styrofoam to me are really really good. So um, I, I mark my faves as uh, Greed, Styrofoam, and that one. 
Mm. And um, and uh, repeat, well, repeater, run. Actually, here's my favorites. Turnover, repeater, <laughs> Brendan one, merchandise, blueprint. <laughs> so every song. Actually, yeah, yeah, pretty <laughs> Yeah, um, but anyway, that's a that's a really that's one of my favorite tunes. It's just so intricate, you know, mm. and it's very. Yeah, but it's it's, it's interesting different. that that's your your fa- one of your favorite tunes because it's so much I think different than the other tunes on the album. Is that it's so much slower, you know, and and a bit more yeah. planned out. Where the others are, there's a lot more energy uh, to really almost everything else on the album. Yeah, well, part of it's the bass line on that tune. I just think yeah. that he, it's so intricate, and I just think he's he's phenomenal. Um, have you all heard Koraki at all? Their new projects? A little bit. I, I haven't bit, heard too yeah. much. Read about. Yeah, it. that's. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, heard check one it out. thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, the the bass lines are pretty cool in that too. But um, so yeah, who's playing uh, bass in that though? Yeah, he's playing bass, and then uh, Ian Mackay plays guitar and sings, and then. His oh. wife Amy plays drums and sings. Okay, so same yeah. same bass player. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, same yeah. bass player. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but yeah, that's just you know so different. But this album more than any other. I I don't know about you guys, but I hear like there's a couple songs where I I hear like an early U2 sound, like almost hmm. like a you know like a boy or war guitar sound. Really? Like just on a couple things here and there. So I mean I, you know. I don't want to speculate what their influence was for every tune, but I mean, you know, I mean, U2 was great back in the early eighties. Um, and I'm sure they yeah. influenced a lot of people. I, I'd have to listen to it almost like with that in mind. Cause I've, I've never, yeah. <laughs> I've never had that thought come to mind, but I'll, I'll, uh, yeah. yeah, I'll listen to it thinking that next just, time. Yeah. Just a little bit like the real, you know, the real edgy, you know, uh, you know, sort of siren sounding guitars of, of Edge back then in huh, the okay. early 80s. Yeah. So. Interesting. interesting. <laughs> yeah. That's my hmm. 25 cents. Cool. You heard it here first. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Blown speakers blowing your mind. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's going to comment, that guy's compared Fugazi to you 2 And the police. <laughs> he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah, he sucks. <laughs> Maybe you just turn off the comments. <laughs> Brendan Canty could not be in the same room with Larry Mullen Jr. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, no respect to, to both bands. <laughs> well but, yeah so so that album is is i don't know uh what probably will always be one of my favorites uh and and dave i think we we saw him in dayton a handful of other times i mean the, the one show in 93 obviously but i think there was a handful of other times either in in dayton or even possibly columbus that that i saw him after a repeater hmm. um and always always a great show hmm. amazing to see always and great price. <laughs> <laughs> Can't beat it. Yeah. Really, honestly, couldn't beat it. Oh, that's yeah. um, something I wanted to mention, too. Like, um, so, of course, there would be huge interest if they came back, right? I mean, all four members are still, apparently, they even play together and practice together sometimes, right? Huh. Um, if they came back, basically, the interest would be so huge that it would almost be impossible, to, like, to keep the five bucks ahead policy. Uh, or I even, think so. Okay, we called it ten bucks. But um, it, oh, it's basically they're they're now they're finally too big to play these kind of atypical venues. To, don't you think? So, I do. Yeah. yeah. Do you think that's part of the reason for this indefinite hiatus? They just don't know logistically how to do a do a Fugazi reunion type thing. Very possibly, but but Greg, yeah. it looks like you had you had something you were about to jump on. <laughs> yeah. Um. Sorry. So, um, yeah, Dave, when you were talking about uh, the price, I wanted to double check the, that price for the uh, Palladium show. And so I'm on the Fugazi Live series. And yeah, door price was $6. So I guess LA. Um, but under sound quality, they have bolded good. And then they have the note 
instrument interrupted by a shoe to Ian's face. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, see, I, I love when that happens, when you have a memory and then you just find the, yeah. you know, the evidence of it. Oh, that's the best. Mm. Well, there you go, Greg. That's so, funny. yeah, that's, he had reason to be, uh, he had reason to be pissed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, how many other bands would have, you know, they would have stopped all ages shows. They would have, you know. Right. And I don't know how I would have reacted, you know. I mean, how many shoes do you want to take to, yeah, to the face? But Yeah. Uh, Especially well, when, when, like, you're, when you're giving away the music for five bucks. Really? Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 Shoe yeah. to the face? Yeah. Well, it seems like they were always about respect. You know, like they, yeah. they wanted yeah, the respect. Yeah that they thought they you know should have. I mean, they're coming yeah, to play yeah, for five dollars and they don't need people throwing shoes at their heads. Yeah. You know. <laughs> so no matter how old, you know. And yeah, it's like yeah. that kid I was talking about, you know, it was like, you are gonna get on stage, you're gonna you're gonna have a memory. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna make you remember, you know, getting on our stage. And, you know, um, and I'm sure that kid never forgot that. You know, oh, I imagine, yeah. Ian Mackay grabbing his leg, you know, and not letting go. So, because uh, I was kind of freaked out by it. I was just like, oh, my God. I just pictured myself in that position. <laughs> <laughs> Being, like, totally mortified. <laughs> you know. Yeah, one, one clip I thought I'd share just to kind of concisely show the intensity of a Fugazi performance. Um, this is from Philadelphia 88, uh, so before uh, Repeater, but just to give you an idea of a young Fugazi in action. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. It's uh, <laughs> not kidding around. Like you could. No, <laughs> no. I, I feel like that really does uh, capture some of that that energy of seeing them. Not like at the, at the outdoor show that we saw them at, Dave, but like in some of the small, you know, indoor venues of literally, I could I could picture kids hanging and jumping off of whatever could have possibly been around. I mean, it's it's uh, yeah, yeah it's awesome. that kind of energy is is it's really infectious, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but the but the forty nine year old in me is like you know get down from there. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna fall and hurt your head. <laughs> but I like I like just thinking of the basketball hoop as kind of a symbol of you know all American normalcy. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Him just down making a mockery it. of it. <laughs> yeah, I love how Brendan is just like continuing to play his drums. Yeah, and it doesn't even phase him. He's just like, yep, yeah. my friend's up on the basketball hoop. Yeah. <laughs> I think he sings the whole song from there. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a great clip. I've never seen that. <laughs> that's awesome. Do you think he was thinking yeah. of that before? I mean, they probably didn't practice there before the show, but when they like set up the their gear. And was looking at the basketball hoop. You think it would maybe crossed his mind, like? Oh, I probably. Think, I like yes. To, I like to think heat of the moment. <laughs> Very well, could be. I think when he's as soon as he walked in that gym, he's like, "Oh, I'm giving up on that. I'm giving up." On that. <laughs> <laughs> That's mine. Either, yeah. either either way, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Upside down is I mean, because I guess if you were to jump up on it, you know any. 
you know, I think a, a young guy or a kid growing up in the United States, you're going to try and hang from the rim, right? You know, like <laughs> yeah. you just dunked yeah. and you're going to hang from the rim. Like to bring yourself upside down. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I could have done that at that age, even like been that like, like oh. lifted myself up like that. No, I, I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's some great footage. Yeah, yeah, that's very cool. They look like they're 14, man. I know. That's crazy. That was eight. Okay, well, so I would like to uh, thank our guests today, right? So uh, G. Ron coming in from Chicago. Yes. yes, thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Yes. It's been great. Yes. I like what you guys are doing. It's been a, a fun show to watch some of your earlier episodes uh, on all the different bands you've covered so far. So I think it's uh, it's very cool what you guys are doing. Thanks for having me. Mm. Hey, thanks for doing it. Thanks for doing it. And Walnut, Mr. Walnut Johnson. Of course. Thank you. Thank you for Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I appreciate you having me, and it was a lot of fun. Yeah, definitely would love to yeah. come back sometime. Mm. Oh, yeah. All right. A lot Thanks. more albums. It's been a lot of fun. And yeah. Excellent choice. Who can argue with Fugazi? <laughs> no one can. <laughs> I yeah, wouldn't want to try. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Mr. Greg, thanks. Thanks, as always. Any uh, comments before we, we introduce our last track? Um, yeah, let's, um, let's get into it. Mm. Um. Well, I said last track, but it's actually the second track on the album. It is the title track of the album. Um, I think you could say the most iconic song from this album. Um, yeah. Um, but still, just, I mean, a wonderful song. Uh, what, do, what, what, what do you guys think? <laughs> well, I mean, it holds up, you know, over time. It, it, it's not... Um... Not that their sound um, was something you could point at and be like, oh, that's a 90s band, but the, the, the sound listening, you know, you listen to the song today and it doesn't have a dated sound in any way. It's still, it's still uh, as good as it was the first time I ever heard it. Yep. Yeah, I think the same thing. I don't, I don't think that song would ever sound dated to me. Hmm. I mean, maybe it could, but it's just so, um, you know, perfect. I mean, the instrumentation and everything um you know the guitar sound you know not, nothing about that song sounds sounds dated at all and, and like i said before the drums are phenomenal to me and, and the the bass and drums together really stand out in that tune i'm excited to hear it again mm. um um oh and i well one thing dave um um uh, and full disclosure um uh, Props to Wikipedia. According to Wikipedia, um, the track re is a reference to a gun, from a quote from Ian Mackay, um, referencing gun violence in D.C. And it's, yeah, not afraid to um, take on difficult subject matter. Um, but at the same time, also, according to that quote, a reference to the Beatles' revolver. I just grabbed that from my shelf. So thank you, Wikipedia, for that. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, okay. We're going to go out with the title track repeater. All right. Thanks. Thanks for a great episode, guys. Yeah. All thanks, right. Dave, for putting it together. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Can't wait to hear Good it. to see everybody. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Good to see you. Okay. Wait. Don't sign out just yet because we'll uh, we'll ride out the track together. All right. Give All me, right. <laughs> give, me, give me a second. You are now one.